there has been skepticism on some of the best industries in California. Actually, a lot more focus has been on coffee over the last couple years. People didn't think that it would grow well, nor would it survive. We have already 7,000 trees planted and have plans for about 10 to 20,000 more. It's the first time we've had the production side and a very hot consumer side of coffee in the same place. My name is Jay Rusky. I'm owner of Goodland Organics and we're here in Galita, California. Our main purpose is to grow high quality fruit and uh, now we're growing high quality coffee too. One of the unique things about this orchard compared to the rest of the world is that the bloom and harvest happens at the same time and so the maturation period, the period of time from flowering to the harvest, can be up to 12 months long. That's similar to what the high quality coffee in the tropical regions uh, have in maturation. They're up in the mountains, they have shade, and that slows down the maturation period. So we're basically using latitude for replacement tropical altitude. But uh, let's go on in it and uh, take a look. This is the site of my original planting. Um, about 12 years ago, I planted them through here. Within three years, they were producing flowers and fruit. An example of a nine-year-old coffee is like this coffee right here is a Typica, one of the most widely grown Arabica varieties. This original plant this year produced over 60 pounds of cherries. And that's significant because around the world, it's about 10, 12 pounds per plant. This one's done 60. If you take a look, we have irrigation and we irrigate three times a week. This is one of the only places in the world where this is done. Usually when you look up coffee production, it gives you some type of information like needs 80 to 90 inches of rain minimum per year. Here, we're a lot more precise. We have uh, all stages of coffee uh, maturity here. We have green bean and coffee cherries. We like to pick them as dark red as possible so they have high sugars. This is a cherry and each cherry has two seeds, hence the coffee bean. All right, let's go further up. So this is an example of our harvest. We harvest into the uh, buckets here. Um, our goal, again, is to get the reddest cherry possible. Something like this is one that would not make the cut in terms of harvest. It has a little bit of uh, damage from snail. Some of uh, the coffee cherries actually produce a yellow flesh when they're ripe. Catura Amarillo actually has some really wonderful uh, notes of like passion fruit in the skin. This coffee plant, if you take a look at it, is strikingly different than the rest of the coffees. It's known for being the long, skinny bean. The most distinct quality of the Lawa here is that it is naturally produces only 20% or so of the caffeine that a normal Arabica coffee can make. Let's take them down to the geisha. We do really well with our geisha as far as keeping the delicate flavor in the cup. We do a wash process to keep it kind of a clean cup. We'll go over that when we do the processing. So what we're going to be taking out is some snail damaged coffee and some overripe cherries. If these cherries were holed in that machine without me sorting, they'd kind of end up being hidden in the batch. There's another layer of sorting at almost every stage down the road. You can kind of see some of the lighter cherries. Here's another example of just kind of an overripe, exposed seed. And at this point, we'll go and hole it. Okay, ready? This is a deep pulper and it uses a uh, abrasive drum to go against an anvil and squeezes the seed out, uh, separating the skins. The skins go fall below it and the seeds come forward into a bath of water. The layer on the seed is called mucilage. It's the actual fruit in the cherry that you're tasting. It's a pretty difficult product to manage. It's pretty slippery when it's wet and it's sticky when it's dry. So what they developed was a fermentation process where this water and the sugars that came out of the cherries will actually ferment the sugars off of the bean. And so then they'll become a drier 
kind of cardboardy feel. The next stage of sorting is actually when you float these beans. What you'll notice is that some seeds are floating on the top. The reason why they're floating is they're not as dense of a bean. They didn't fill out their shell. So that's what we kind of look at for another aspect of quality that you can't see. So I'm gonna dry these. Then we do one last layer of washing with the seeds just because there's still a little bit of slimy fruit on it, but if we wash it one more time, it just kind of gives off the last bits of sugar. So I'd say for every batch, we probably dry it in the sun, if we're lucky, with sunny days for about two days. After that, we bring it inside into our drying area. So then the drying phase takes about two weeks. These are the, the beans after they dry. This is showing promise for being a great quality. So now we are gonna hold this batch. It's a kind of a precise procedure because the everything needs to be adjusted to the size of bean. What will come out is the green bean. So here's an example is that you'll have the parchment coffee and then you have the green bean on the inside. So after you extract all the beans collect them in the vat and you have to get rid of the parchment. So I'm just going to be blowing the chaff out. So now it's uh, mostly clean. There's a couple more stages to fully clean it off. So what I'm going to do is sort and grade the coffee. Generally this is going to sift out the smaller beans and also I'm going to sort out the cracked ones as well as the parchment. So the smaller beans will fall and then I'll sort out these guys with the parchment out. So there you go, that's the final batch. This is what we package and sell to customers directly. I'm Jeff Watts. I'm a coffee buyer, an importer for Intelligentsia Coffee. When we receive a sample of green coffee that's been sent to us by a farm, the first thing it has to do is be evaluated uh, through a series of physical tests. This is Amanda. She's one of our quality control specialists. We sometimes call her the coffee doctor. In this room, we're evaluating samples of coffee that we roast here. After that, it gets put out on a table and sorted bean by bean to check for uniformity and look for any defective beans and create a count of the number of beans that are imperfect. She's uh, extremely meticulous and careful. Uh, she pays attention to all the small details which it takes to be a good bean doctor. You can't be <laughs> impatient because it's, uh, you know, it's a slow, tedious process. Then the coffee gets weighed and is put into a sample roaster and will roast 100 grams of coffee. The sound you're hearing right now is first crack. That's the sound of the beans uh, releasing energy, uh, which is sort of like popcorn popping. And right now what I'm doing is I'm looking for the appropriate uh, color spectrum that we need to develop this coffee. And then in the morning, we will grind it and weigh it out into 11 gram doses and cup it and spend about an hour evaluating the sensory traits of the coffee and recording them, discussing them. We've got a very diverse selection of coffees here from as far south as Bolivia, and as close as Santa Barbara, California. We have seven samples, so I'm gonna label them A, B, C, D, E, F, G. We cup everything blind without knowing what it is, because if we knew what coffee we were tasting, it would cloud our judgment, it would introduce bias. So the first thing that we'll do is to smell the coffees, the dry aroma or fragrance. They say uh, in wine that there are somewhere around 180 different chemical compounds that contribute to taste and aroma. In coffee, they've identified close to 1,000. So by that metric, you could say that coffee's perhaps around four times as complex as wine. You know, you always try to keep a poker face, not influence the other people around you, but occasionally you just can't help yourself. You'll have an outburst. Uh, if you pour very slowly, you don't create any turbulence, so you don't agitate the coffee, and that affects the way it extracts. Uh, once it hits four minutes, we're going to break through the crust, and that releases a lot of uh, aromatic 
vapor that's been building up under this crust, and it's a good chance to get a strong smell of the coffee. Let's do it. I'll take the right cup. After this, we'll skim. And if you let this sit on there for a longer amount of time, some of it would sink in and change the flavor of the coffee. So after this, we wait for the coffee to cool because right now it's, it's too hot to drink. We're cupping this, and by cupping, we're gonna be slurping from the spoon into our palate and kind of lays evenly across our palate. So we're able to evaluate sweetness, bitter, sour, uh, pretty much the full spectrum of what we're trying to evaluate. Hey Jeff, could you wanna talk about the loud slurpers versus the, <laughs> the quiet slurpers? Well, there are, uh, you know, if you ever taste coffee with, especially with Brazilians, they will aspirate the coffee in a way that makes a loud screaming noise like a, Sounds it, like a tent zipper. Yeah, it's like a sometimes. jet plane taking off, and it's uh, actually sometimes loud enough that it, it hurts. Right. So the top scoring coffee by a landslide for me on this coffee was uh, sample F. This is where, you know, when you talk about the holy grail, this is where we really start to, uh, to believe in, in magic when it comes to coffee drinking. This is one, I gave it a 98, uh, which is very high for me. I hardly ever give things that high. This is the kind of coffee that probably will, will be among the best that we have in our hands all year. So uh, what is this magical F? This is the farm from Bolivia called Tukesi. It's their geisha. geisha. So this is the, the famous uh, geisha variety that was, came, came to be known uh, by the, the world of coffee lovers in like, I think 2003 or 2004. It's called geisha because the place where its origin has been traced to is a small town called geisha that is in the far western part of Ethiopia. Probably the most expensive coffee on the planet, you know, somewhere around $10 or more per cup. If you look back at the footage and see people's faces when they smell that, you might, you might catch a reveal there because it, uh, you know, it, it speaks very loudly for itself. It just tasted like if you were to put every lifesaver in your mouth. <laughs> it's just like so many flavors and just where did, like the palate's so rich on that coffee. It, like I can still feel the floral yeah. notes. C, what did you see? I was the high guy there. I gave it a four in sweetness, which is, I think, what really carried it for me. It was really, really sweet, clean. I rewarded the aromatics, too. I thought it had a lot of good aromatics. Uh, this one is the Goodlands Organic Typica. Pretty damn good for a California coffee, I think. That's exciting to yeah. see that. Um... I was pretty surprised that Typica actually scored fairly well. Yeah, it definitely surprised me. The coffee was more complex than I was expecting. I think it surprised us all. Pretty awesome, that's a, a victory for, for California coffee. Uh, this is Clancy Kramer, our head roaster at Copa Vida Cafe. And not only is he a magician with uh, coffee roasting, but he's also a good friend and, a, a, and just an amazing person to work next to. <laughs> this is my, my friend and boss, Steve Chang. Uh, he is the president of Copa Vida, and he is also my friend. Yeah. You said that twice. What, you're my friend? Yeah, yeah, that's good though. I like okay. it. You're, you're, you're that good of a friend, yeah. <laughs> that's good. There's something about Pasadena that's very modern and at the same time it's quaint and there's a lot of uh, small communities here and a lot of diversity in Pasadena. It's one of those places that I, I really find myself at home. We see ourselves both at the cafe here at the roastery as stewards. We're just part, the last stage of a whole chain of events that leads to that point in order to get that flavor out of that coffee. One of the cool things about roasting itself is each batch is done closely uh, to the profile as you can. So we've used the roast profile graph 
to figure out what's actually happening inside of it. This green line right here is the temperature. It's showing me what temperature the beans are at during this live process. So it started way up here, that's because the roaster was really hot, and when all the coffee came in itself, uh, the temperature of the roaster went all the way down because the, the beans are going in at room temperature and the roaster's starting off at 400 degrees. So that's kind of where they meet. We call that the, the turn point. After that point, generally if we want a very sweet coffee, we'll throw a lot of heat at it very quickly. We will make sure that the sugars itself will be very lively and sweet. That, that roast profile itself is very quick, very fast, and just a ride. It's just you throw a lot of heat at those beans as, as much as possible. Now, if we wanted to roast a different coffee and have that coffee be more familiar with like a big body, what we'd do is we'd actually make the, the roast profile a lot longer over time. Well, upcoming is going to be first crack. First crack is a great uh, point in the roast that we know it's happening because there's a loud, audible noise. I don't know if you guys can hear it. First crack happens. Um, moisture and CO2 are just exploding out of the bean. The bean almost doubles its size at that point. My preference is to roast between uh, first crack and uh, before second crack. A lot of people enjoy lively fruits and flowers, um, great chocolate tones, vanilla, caramels. I mean, we find that a lot of that uh, lies in this region. One of the terms that is familiar with people is light and a dark roast. So I'm going to show you what that is. Light roast will start right here, during and right after first crack. Medium roast, it is between first crack and second crack. That roast degree could give you different flavors. It also could hide some flavors. Remove some of those uh, fruits and flowers but still can have them present. If we keep moving, a uh, darker roast is, can be right before second crack and onward up until those beans are just black and taste like an ashtray. So that is a batch of coffee at Copa Vita Roasting. That coffee should taste like lime, honey, apricot, and a little bit of honeydew. And that's what we do here. I'm gonna send out on a date. And I want to impress a woman that seems knowledgeable about coffee. What are the questions that I mean, I'm gonna Honestly, don't go there. <laughs>we talk about brewing a cup of coffee, it really is just about pouring water over ground coffee. It could be that simple. Uh, chances are you want to pay a little more attention to it because the cup that results is highly affected by how we brew the cup and the brew strength is really dependent on your ratios of water to coffee. In terms of somebody brewing coffee at home, the biggest mistake is lack of precision and measurement. If you don't have your ratios right and you don't really have an intended target of how strong or how dilute your coffee is, none of the other stuff's really gonna matter. First and foremost is the amount of coffee we put in. If we're not precise in our measurement of the beans, we're likely either gonna get uh, a cup that's too dilute or too strong. Secondly is the grind. The quality of grind is huge. The more uniform, the more even the extraction is going to be. Grind fineness dramatically affects the extraction of the coffee. The finer we go, the more extraction we get. So we tend to go a little fine, Lighter roasted coffee tends to be a little more insoluble, so throwing hotter water on the coffee, grinding it finer, generally produces a more flavorful cup. Next thing we need to do is prepare a dripper. Nobody likes to chew on paper because it doesn't taste good, so what we'll do while we're pre-warming the pitcher is pour a good amount of water through the filter to rinse out any paper taste. We need to make sure that we use good water. It's purified water, but you don't want to use distilled water or too pure water. We want to actually have some minerals because they do affect extraction. Water temperature is key. Uh, I can't stress it enough. If your water's not hot enough, especially if you have a fairly insoluble light roasted coffee, you're gonna end up with a coffee that is under extracted. If we don't weigh our water, we still run the risk of pouring too much or too little. So in terms of consistency, it's important to actually weigh the water that we're pouring. And now we're going to uh, pour the grounds into the V60 device. It's important to kind of level them out. Our kettle is now properly pre-warmed, which is important. But if we're not preheating our uh, brewing devices, as soon as we take water out of our hot water tower, it's gonna lose a lot of temperature, which is not good for the resulting cup. We, we always start with a really hot kettle of water and a timer. Now CO2 is a result of the roasting process. It is a sign of fresh coffee, it's a great thing. But if we don't get it off, it could actually hinder or inhibit the extraction. So the first thing I'm gonna do is pour enough water to pre-infuse, which is allowing the built up CO2 to off gas. Now I'm gonna take my paddle and agitate the grounds. I wanna make sure that the grounds are evenly saturated. In this case, 
and give a full minute, so very fresh coffee, allow the CO2 to come off, and then I'll actually start brewing. Believe it or not, the speed in which you pour the water does make a difference. The faster you pour, the quicker that brew is gonna be. That means the contact time between the water and the grounds is less. Less contact time means less extraction. I like to keep the introduction of water low and slow by limiting the rise of the coffee grounds in the water. I'm slowing down the brew process. I don't want to brew this cup of coffee too fast because if I do, it might be a little under extracted. You, know, you should be ending around three, three and a half minutes typically, at least for the style of coffee that we roast and serve. So as you can see, I just let the water level drop before I add a little bit more. And I'll keep doing this until I reach my target weight, which is, in this case, 340 grams. So again, everybody's style of brewing a cup can be different. I choose this method because of the style of cup that it produces. I think it's the best for my palate and the style of coffee that we're trying to brew here at Portola. Mm. That's fantastic. Delicious coffee. Lots of nice uh, fruit notes. And, uh, and I did a good job. If I don't say so myself. So I'm here with my business partner and wife. Handle the business stuff, not a barista. Brains behind the business. I love working with my husband. I think we balance each other out. Just like a little more creative. And I kind of like dial him in and get him back on track sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the business is our life, but it doesn't feel like work. We both enjoy it that much. It can get a little crazy sometimes too, but we don't let that show in the shop. We just wait till we go home. <laughs> Theorem is our concept bar. We give the barista kind of like a playground that they can be creative with. So if the drink sounds ridiculous, crazy, super awesome, uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're doing in here. Hey, can you whip me up that coffee Negroni? Yeah, sounds good. So this was a particularly hard beverage to curate. And it is based on the classic Italian cocktail, the Negroni, which is comprised of gin, vermouth, and Campari. I made a Campari reduction and I made a botanical based solute with Rose petals, coriander, juniper, dried orange, dried lemon peels, and some of our tea from our seventh tea bar. And I used coffee in place of vermouth. And it is a flash cooled iced coffee utilizing our V60 brew method. So it reduces the amount of quinic acid, keeps the bitterness low, highlights the acidity because we're, we're hitting it with hot water as opposed to a long drawn out cold brew. The result is a cocktail that's very balanced, equal parts bitter, sweet, and citrusy. Thank you, sir. No problem. Cheers. 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 This is one of our all-time favorites here in Theorem. It really captures the essence of the original drink. What we're saying is that coffee can be every bit as complex and dynamic as a spirit. When you come into Theorem, if you sit down and feel like you're actually at a cocktail bar, but you're sipping on this amazing coffee drink, it blows people's minds. My name is Michael Phillips. Uh, I'm the director of training for Blue Bottle Coffee Roasters. I've also competed in barista competitions. I've won the U.S. barista competition twice in 2009 and 2010. And in 2010, I went on to win the world barista competition. Today, we're working in our training lab. This is Melinda Durham. Uh, and the machine we have at our disposal is a La Marzocco GB5. They make really great equipment. Temperature stability, pressure stability, all of those things are, are very crucial to an espresso machine. Um, I mean, we're going to extreme lengths to get our dose accurate to the tenth of a gram. It doesn't matter if the machine doesn't keep a, a stable profile. And then a Mazer Rover grinder. The grinder is just as important as the machine because without it creating that really consistent, precise grind, you can't accurately work with coffee as an ingredient. Right now we're focusing on what we call dial-in, and that's adjusting the various parameters that we use to pull a shot of espresso. So the big three things that we're looking at are the dose, which refers to how much coffee, and we're measuring that down to the tenth of a gram. We've got yield, that's the amount of espresso coming out. We measure that in terms of grams as well. What do we land at? 11. Go ahead and make it coarser. And then we've got time. Time refers to from the second you press this button and water is pumping through to the second you stop it. With those three numbers, you can kind of triangulate to create a formula for an espresso in terms of how you execute it. So the Hayes Valley 
is usually 20 grams in for the dose, 20 grams out for the yield, and then roughly in the high 20s to the low 30s in terms of time for the extraction. We're making adjustments to the grinder to help us get that. The finer we go, the longer it takes us to get to that 20 grams, the coarser we go, the faster we can get to that 20 grams. That speed with which we get there really affects the flavor profile. The faster a shot runs, typically you're gonna experience more sour components in the flavor profile, whereas the slower it runs, you're gonna experience more bitter components. And we wanna find that sweet spot right in the middle that we consider an ideal extraction. What do you think? Too over extracted. Okay, so how are we gonna shift it? More coarse? A little bit more coarse. So what are the specs for this? 20 grams, 21 seconds. Did you hit the, the dose just right? I did. Perfect. How's this one taste? Better, more bright. <clears throat> yeah, I think we can stay with this setting though. Okay. Move to our second step. I worked in coffee for four years maybe now, five years. At the coffee shops I worked at, we never weighed any of the shots. We really focused on how the drink looked rather than how it tasted. I didn't realize there's so much more to it. He's been training me ever since I was hired here. It was probably the best, most intense training I've ever had in coffee. I'm paying her later. <laughs> Spot on. When I first started, it was a little intimidating. He would be always on the back bar watching your every move. Not in a creepy way. <laughs> no, it's totally... In a good, in a good way. We learned a lot and we're terrified at the same time. It's a healthy balance of fear and discipline. So you can tell by the way that that sounds whether or not she's butchered the milk to an extent. Uh, if you're in a cafe and you hear this loud kind of screeching noise coming from the steam wand, that's a good chance that they haven't aerated the milk enough or that they're going too high in temperature. La Tiare occupies a very interesting position in the world of specialty coffee that's both great and problematic because a lot of baristas that get into this get very involved in how good their latte art looks and they focus on that particular skill when you know, that's like saying, you know, how pretty does your food look? Well, how does it taste? Or what latte art really signifies is that you've textured the milk in a proper fashion. So if you have a nice glossy sheen on the surface and the, the lines of the pattern are round but sharp, that's a sign that you have good texture in terms of the foam that you've created. Nice, nice, keep that. All right, drop in, good. And, oh, you're getting greedy. Nice. She nailed it. In this pour, you can see a lot of things that we're striving for in the others. Milk quality is huge. You can tell that by how defined the lines are in the pattern. Contrast on this is really great, a nice sheen to it. All of these speak to the fact that the bubbles comprising the froth are very tiny and tight-knit, which gives a much better texture and mouthfeel to it. Great intentionality, great balance, great contrast, great definition. Uh, it's an excellent pour. Very well done. Thank you. The way that I make coffee today, worlds apart from how I made coffee even three years ago. I'm still learning my craft from people every day. The level of knowledge and technique and technology that we're bringing into play constantly transforms what we're chasing and the bar just keeps getting higher. It feels like it's at a fevered pitch right now. Give it two years. You're gonna see the face of coffee in LA changed dramatically, and it'll easily be one of the destinations that people put on the map when they're talking about journeys to coffee mecca.